Welcome everyone. My name is Melissa Bostrom. I'm the Assistant Dean for Graduate Student Professional Development in the Graduate School and I want to welcome you to today's panel discussion on careers in business and consulting for the humanities and social sciences. Um, and I'm pleased to welcome you here on behalf of the Graduate School as well as my partners in the Office of Postdoctoral Services. Um, Mark Matheson is representing the postdoc office today. He's our videographer and uh, a man of many talents, I should say. And also the Duke Career Center is co-sponsoring this event. And it's uh, part of the Careers Beyond Academia series, which is going on this year. And I think we're up to about 33 or 34 events in that series this year. So if you haven't uh, checked out some other events in the series, I really may want to do so. I think that you'll find something for everyone in there. I apologize that we're missing one of our panelists. Um, perhaps she'll slip in late, but uh, we'll go ahead and get started uh, to respect everyone's time. So I'm really delighted to introduce our panelists today. I'm going to start from my immediate right. Uh, Heidi Justo is principal at Career Path Writing Solutions. She holds a PhD uh, in history from Duke University, a master's in history from Youngstown State University, and a bachelor's degree in history and political science from Youngstown State University. So we're really pleased to welcome her back. To her right is Dr. Robert Williams. He uh, is an editing services and quality control editor at Research Square in Durham. Uh, he is a PhD in philosophy from Duke as well, another Duke alum, and he holds a bachelor's degree and master's degree in psychology and philosophy from Texas Tech University. I'm really glad to welcome you back. And then to Robert's right, uh, Joshua Colling Perrin, who is Director of Public Engagement at Waste Zero. He holds a PhD in English Language and Literature from Yale University and a BA cum laude from Marshall College in English. So we're really pleased to welcome him today as well. So just to let everybody know a little bit about the format for today, I've shared some questions with our panelists in advance and we'll start with those questions and then we'll also have some opportunities for questions from the audience as we go. So we look forward to the conversation. So I'll start with the, the first question, and I'll just start with <coughs> this one, and that is, what's a typical work week look like for you? Um, how do you spend your time at work? So um, my work weeks are, in some ways, pretty similar week to week, um, but there's also a lot of variety. But a typical week would include, um, of course, all my administrative tasks, right? We all have to keep up with email. That transcends um, all professions, I think. So um, administrative tasks of email, um, invoicing clients, scheduling meetings. Um, but then beyond that, I have a lot of face-to-face -face meetings with clients. So I'll meet um, clients locally, you know, in, in Durham, RTP, or Raleigh. I will also Skype with clients and have phone calls. In my work hour, I keep flexible hours. Um, I have, you know, th three days a week I have kind of standard nine to five hours, but then several nights a week I'll work evenings and then sometimes I work weekends and that is to accommodate um, people in different time zones and with different scheduling constraints. I have clients globally, so um, so that's just part of what I have to do, but it's also a choice because um, it fits my schedule too, my personal schedule. Um, my work week is fairly unstructured. I have customer deadlines, um, but I usually have the papers I'm to edit in hand well before the deadline, so when I do them, it's largely uh, open. There are a few meetings um, one or two meetings a week um, where I can either be at the office for those meetings, usually internal meetings, or I can do those through Skype. Um, I like to structure my days so that I'm gone around five, um, but there are a few things that you know, sort of be on call to field questions from editors if they run into problems. Um, or to assign papers out to editors that are coming from the customers, sign them out. And those are sort of structured blocks of time that I spend. But beyond that, I have lots of control over um, when I work. And, uh, I manage to uh, get a day and a half off, usually. I uh, work a half day, uh, Sunday, and usually I'm not working on Saturdays. I usually choose to work on Sundays just to get ahead since I have papers in hand, and that allows me to have shorter days there for the week. 
thanks, and thanks for giving us the chance to have this conversation. Um, I, before I answer that question, I also want to just take a step back and say, um, what I'm doing now is communications um, and kind of something like public relations. But I have also, since I left graduate school a dozen years ago, uh, been a reporter and editor in the journalism environment, and I've been a uh, management consultant. So I've had kind of a liberal arts career um, that uh, informs a lot of how I think about this work. Um, and how I would talk to you about it. Um, uh, with that in mind, my, my, my week, I have no standard week. When I left graduate school, one of the goals I had was to have a work style that was diver as diverse as what I really loved about being in academia, which is um, never sitting in the same place for long, never, uh, never doing the same kind of work for long. So this week I'm in the office all week. Next week I'll spend three days in Washington, D.C. having meetings. I, uh, I frequently have in-person meetings. Um, my work style, uh, the kind of work I do changes from sitting on my computer in isolation and writing to having one-on-one -on -one conversations and meetings all the way through to uh, public speaking at um, events that are large, medium, and small. So a lot of different kinds of work in a lot of different places. I'm a person who thrives on um, the change that comes from breaking up what I do. It's a lot like an academic's life. It's just that structurally, um, well, obviously the content's different. Um, so I don't have a standard work week, but um, you know, one of the things that I definitely recommend anybody who's thinking about leaving academia is that think about, not only think about what the job is, but think about what the work style of the job is. Um, this is one, this flexibility is one that, that suits me uh, very well. I, you know, I also um, make it a point to leave office at a certain time each day. Um, I have three elementary school age children. Uh, eating dinner together is a thing that um, the, the five of us as a family prioritize. Um, there's a cost for that. Um, and I think there's a question later about work-life balance. I don't want to go too far into this, but definitely, um, again, there's a kind of, you know, there's, there's flexibility. And um, quite honestly, if I can work a little less during the day and if I turn the computer on for a little while in the evening, children go to sleep, that's, that's an okay thing as well. So a lot of diversity. So the next question I think is going to be a loaded question because it's going to have really different answers. Um, but it is, how did you find your current job? Was it by applying to an online posting? Was it through networking? Um, so feel free to share your current job or, or maybe your first job out of graduate school depending on what you think is, is most relevant to the audience. And I'll start this time with Joshua. Okay, thanks. Um, so I moved um, to North Carolina from Washington, D.C. in 2004. Um, and I came to work for a management consulting firm. Uh, that job I found cold. Someone had recommended that it was a good company for me to look into. It was a company that valued um, people with uh, academic experience. Um, and so I, I applied for a job completely cold. As it turns out, I had a reference inside the company. I didn't know that until I applied in my resume, worked its way through the, through the company. Um, Somebody I didn't know was there. Um, I have actually, in one way or another, even though across three jobs in three different companies, now been with the same people um, since 2004, since January 2004, um, because I have I have followed the people as they've gone on through different industries, the people who, who ran the company and now run other companies. Um, my, my first job, though, was based on, my first job out of graduate school in 2003 uh, in Washington was a really a direct, uh, it was again. It was a cold. It was a, a cold call. Um, but it was. It built directly out of work I did for one year between college and graduate school. I had been a reporter between 1994 and 1995 in D.C. covering health policy, uh, and I applied for another reporter job with a different publication covering health policy in Washington. Um, and as a funny story about the value of uh, our degrees, I thinking that nobody would want me for anything. I for this reporter job and handed over the application mm -hmm. and was actually called in instead to interview for the open editor job that they had. Um, and it, so there and just kind of moved from the uh, writing and editing side up to the business side of the publication over some time. Uh, but you know, I, I definitely didn't do anything, um, I, nothing, nothing formal. It was all cold searching. It was also harder back then. There was less of a structure for this kind of thing. Robert. So, I, so my current job is my first job uh, after grad school, and I found it at a career fair here at Duke 
Um, I went there not really knowing what to expect. Um, I sort of looked at the list of, of employers there and didn't see anything that particularly looked like a good fit, but I was going to go just to get some experience of putting myself in that environment. And, you know, I walked up to a, a few tables and got some information. At that point, I think primarily pulling on my science background um, more than my humanities background. Um, but I found Research Square there and started working as a contractor. And um, really, I think you know, the, the job fair was the only route I pursued. At that point, I was not sure whether I was going to stay in academia or not. So I was sort of trying to get my feet wet there. And I'll interject that I, I think Robert's talking about the Master's and PhD Career Fair that's held each November at the Friday Center at UNC and a consortium of six graduate schools in North Carolina <coughs> co-sponsor that. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a wide range of, of different type employers. Mm -hmm. I'm going to hold off on Heidi for now because there's a question specifically for her. But um, I also wanted to ask, are, were there any um, databases or are there any databases or online resources that you would recommend for folks in this room who are looking for job postings? And I'll direct that to Joshua and Robert and, I, and then maybe Heidi. I've never used one. Um, and, you know, I actually, uh, the, 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 the structure for this kind of thing at Yale when I was leaving was so poor that um, I ended up completely inadvertently uh, training the graduate career services director in some things that helped her because I was one of the first people to sort of leave and successfully find a job outside of academia. There was nothing. It was this uncharted territory. That's why I'm so glad to come back and talk at times like this because I feel like I'm giving back so that people aren't in that same awful position I was in back then. No, is the answer. <laughs> I, I think my answer is similar. I mean, I was fairly convinced I was going to stay in academia. And um, so I haven't used much of anything. I think I have a LinkedIn account, but I could not possibly tell you what's on that. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the, so the only sort of resource I used was in the department and asking professors you know, what they knew about jobs outside of the academy. And there was not much help there. So well, you can look into consulting without any sort of references of who to talk to or you know, computer science work. And so inside the department didn't work much, but I could use I wasn't thinking about LinkedIn. Um, I like LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn. Um, I don't depend on it, but I think it serves two really valuable purposes. One, if you turn the permissions on so that anyone, which you can do, so that anyone can see your profile, you, you know, in the same way, you know, anything you're applying for, anybody you meet at a networking event who Googles you will find it and learn more about you if they want to. You want that tool to be available to those <coughs> who are trying to learn more about you after meeting you, whether it's through a job application or through some kind of networking one-on-one -on -one or in an event. And the other piece, and by the way, please, um, anybody who's interested in the work I've done, link in with me. Uh, friend me on LinkedIn, connect with me on LinkedIn, um, because we can mine each other's um, contacts. You know, we have this, you know, so I've got a network now of people, and it is, you know, primarily North Carolina based, but also heavily in Washington, D.C., New York, San Francisco, and Boston, of people in fields related to mine. If you're somebody who's interested in those fields, and you're connected with me on LinkedIn, you look through that, and I invite you to, so I tell everybody I, I have networked look through it, that's an incredibly valuable tool. Ask me for an introduction. I'm, that's, I'm always happy to do it. Other people are too. It's a, that kind of tool, that feature of your ability to see my network and to see other people you network with, to see their networks is very valuable. Yeah, and at the end, I'll talk about and give you some information about an online LinkedIn workshop for specifically for Duke graduate students. Remind me at the end. I'd be, yeah, I'd be happy to speak about this because, so um, I didn't share that what I do, I so, and also in my daily, my, or my week to week, the obvious thing that I actually do writing and editing, um, I should have said that, that I, I do that all the time. <laughs> um, so, but I help people primarily with what I call high stakes documents, and that's typically professional documents, CVs, resumes, cover letters, 
um, personal statements for graduate school, um, five-year career plans, LinkedIn profiles. And one of the services I, I also offer is um, I have a, I, I very much um, love interacting with graduate students and helping the, um, educate them about what the options are. And so um, some of the sites and websites that were helpful for me and also that are, are you know, will probably be maybe useful for you. Um, versatile PhD, if you haven't heard of that yet. Um, LinkedIn, yes, 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 <laughs> okay. Um, I, you'd think LinkedIn pays me for the way I talk about it. They don't. Um, but LinkedIn, you've heard me talk about LinkedIn. <laughs> um, so you can connect with alumni. LinkedIn's an excellent tool for facilitating informational interviews. LinkedIn, it will calibrate and give you job searches of, you know, this is a job that you might be interested in. Um, you can, you know, connect with me, and then through these second links, those are the most powerful links for um, the second connections for helping you create these job opportunities. I just see LinkedIn as this, almost this, it, it's, you know, intentionally a weird saying, right? Like this black hole of opportunity. You don't know what opportunity is going to spring up just from a single, single um, connection. So connect, you know, get your profile up there. You don't have to put a lot of time on it, you know, instead of, if you procrastinate with, I don't know, Facebook or Instagram, start procrastinating with LinkedIn. Um, mm -hmm. Indeed is an excellent job search tool. It's one of the common ones. Um, the Muse, which was actually co-founded by a Duke grad. It's a huge, um, you know, very prominent website out there for job seekers. And it has, uh, it has good information on it. Um, Look outside of your academic connections, which I know for some people is hard, but start talking to people who work outside of academia. See what they're doing. Ask what they're doing, what they like about their do what they're doing. Um, another website, From PhD to Life. Um, that's run by Jennifer Polk. She has like 6,000 Twitter followers. <laughs> she is a career coach. Um, she's up in Toronto, and she has a whole series of In Transition where she's interviewed people who have PhDs in what they're doing now. And she's a history person, too, so she has a humanities focus. Um, Glassdoor, after you've identified a company, look at Glassdoor, and that has reviews of the corporation, and you get the inside scoop because it's from anonymous employees. So one time my husband was contacted by a recruiter, he looked up the company and we're like, ooh, we're staying away from there because everybody's miserable. There's a really high turnover rate, right? There's and, a lot of data in the US. Yes, it's, yeah, and I mean, especially if there's 100 people reviewing it, right? If there's 100 people saying stay away, you probably want to stay away. Um, and then another one that I don't know that much about yet, but one of my clients uses it, um, ONET which is Occupational Information Network, and that helps you identify your knowledge, skills, abilities, and what you're suited for, and those KSAs also help you identify things if you're looking for government jobs, which is a different topic than private sector. But those are a few um, ones that I thought to be my nerdy self and write down, because <laughs> I didn't want to forget. And also, last, LinkedIn pays a lot of money to keep their search, their LinkedIn to pop up at the top of Google. So if you're meeting someone, even if you don't care about LinkedIn and you don't use it, you have to assume the person's going to Google you and they're going to try to see what you have on your LinkedIn profile. Can, so. can I add also, you made me think of something which is um, Google as, a, as another tool. Um, you know, uh, SEO yourself. Make sure Google, mm -hmm. Google yourself on a browser where you're like, on, on a browser you don't use. So a browser that isn't um, populated with your um, Google profile, your Gmail, your preferences, um, your search history, and things like that. Like, if you have to use a friend's computer or literally like download a fresh browser you don't ordinarily use, do that. Google it yourself, see what comes up, and scrub it. Um, I, uh, I had occasion to, to do this recently. I made sure that, so for example, I um, killed the links to an old blog I did when my kids were babies. I, um, made private the links to the Vimeo of them toddling around in diapers. I did a couple of other things to make sure that my LinkedIn 
came up at the top. Um, I gave a talk like this at Yale two years ago. I wanted that to be up high too, so I scrubbed it so that, you know, and over, over the course of like a month it worked. Um, it took a little time. But, and then so it was like, it was a Google result for me that was what I wanted to, to be for professional purposes. So sort of check, you, you want to know what happens with an eye toward a professional search when, you, when your name is Google. So I want to shift gears just a moment. We asked about how you found your first job. Heidi actually created her first job. And I so I, I wanted Heidi to talk maybe a little bit, if you would, about what, um, what motivated you to start your own business and create your first job. So that's a good question. What motivated me? Um, so if you want the first, I guess I'd say the, like the long explanation of it, um, I have a podcast um, on, oh, another one, PhD Career Guide. That's a really great one, a great site for you. Um, but so I have a podcast that details how I went from, you know, dissertation to business owner. Um, but I think the, some, there are a few things I think that were critical. One was that I started realizing that, like, I finally accepted that I didn't want to be a professor. Right? And that was a process that probably took a couple years. Um, and I started realizing actions speak louder, I think, than words. And my actions were always brainstorming, how am I going to be a professor and what type of business do I want to open on the side? Like, how am I going to do that when I'm married? I have, now I have two kids. Um, but it was, I, I always was brainstorming, what am I going to do on the side? I've always had that entrepreneurial spirit ever since being a little kid. Um, so I think that was just always been in me. But um, for much of um, my graduate schooling, I worked at Duke's Writing Studio. And I realized that I loved working one-on-one -on -one with writers. And I felt like that was where I, you know, I got such personal satisfaction out of doing that. Um, but while I was in grad school, I really took advantage of the resources Duke had. And part of that is also, you know, being part of Duke. So I, um, I interviewed for some positions. The one which I ended up taking myself out of the running for was a, a postdoc at the Academic Resource Center because that was also mentoring. So I thought, well, wanting to maybe stick within higher ed. But I realized that wasn't a great fit. Um, I love evaluating writing. So I applied for and I got hired and I did a one year temporary position at Duke Admissions. And I also worked at American Journal Experts, which is part of, which is a division of, or, or owned by Research Square, as a contract editor. So I, and I worked as a managing editor for an academic journal that was housed here um, before it, it, the editorship moved. And I realized that I loved, um, I loved editing, and I, I loved this intellectual work. But more than anything, I loved working with people directly. Um, so from there, I okay, just kind of by chance, people who I knew, friends and family, started asking me to review their resumes because they knew I did this writing thing, right? And I'm always writing. I'm writing my paper, my, my six-chapter-long paper. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and lo and behold, the first seven people I helped, and after that I stopped keeping track, they all got jobs within, you know, at most it took two months. Um, so I realized I loved working with resumes, and to me they're this puzzle, they're this specific genre of writing, and I, I loved working with them. Um, so from there, as that idea took shape, and I have a very supportive husband who's always worked in business, um, and so he was very supportive, and we did brainstorming, and I, um, I used Duke's Career Center. I mean, it, the, one, there's a couple of the um, counselors who I really feel were instrumental in, in helping me. And neither of them are here anymore, unfortunately. But um, I, I researched, so anything that, like any person with a PhD or almost has a PhD would do, right? I research stuff. But I didn't over-research it. And um, once I had my idea, I learned just the basics of needing to get an LLC, and which is, stands for a limited liability company. Um, and then I kind of, I jumped. And that's where Annie Maxfield, who's no longer with us, but at one point I was in her office and she said, Heidi, I think you just need to go for it. 
because you're never going to be 100% prepared, right? My website, which I did on my own, I knew, like, well, I'm going to end up changing this eventually, which I have since then. You know, there's there, not everything was put in place, but I, I, I went for it, and it's been wonderful. So it was, um, I, but one of the key things was freeing myself from the idea that it was okay that I didn't want to be a professor. Not that I still love history, but um, I realized that I, I wanted to, to do something else professionally. So I'm going to take a break and acknowledge that we've just welcomed our uh, fourth panelist, um, Krista Black. Can you say your last name? Mazumdar. Mazumdar. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here with us today. And um, <coughs> Krista has a PhD in art history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill uh, and a master's degree also from UNC. Um, so I'm sorry to welcome you to Duke's campus on a day like today. <laughs> <laughs> and um, a bachelor's degree in Spanish language and literature from the University of Kansas. And she is Academic Services Advisor and Managing Editor at American Journal Experts. If I could ask you to maybe just talk briefly about your current position and how you found it, and then I think that we'll kind of round out the conversation. Um, well, I can start with where I found it. I, I began as a contract editor for American Journal Experts actually back in 2011. And I was kind of nearing that point in ABD hood where the teaching fellowship had run out and I was applying for grants. And so I wanted to find something that I could do in order to help supplement my income. Um, and so American Journal Experts was one of those things that I kind of fell upon. And um, a really helpful resource for me was UNC's um, Career Center. Um, so that's where I found out about the opportunity. And I went to one of their campus visits. I went both for editing and translation. Um, to see which I would rather do, and I ultimately chose editing. And I did that for a couple of years until a position opened up um, for a managing editor. And I applied for that. Um, and that was a full-time job, and at that point I was still writing my dissertation, so it was definitely a balancing act between writing and working full-time. But as I continued to do it, I realized that this was something that I really enjoyed doing, and I liked the flexibility of the position. Um, one of the things that I was really interested in when I started um, at American Journal Experts was customer service and working with customers. Our customers are predominantly um, people who, for whom English is not their first language, and so we're helping them to sort of translate their papers into natural sounding English. So it was really important to me, especially with the language skills that I gained you know, throughout college, to kind of work with some of these customers and try to get out what they really mean. And so as time has gone on, I've moved into more of a customer service role as opposed to an editing role. So I do primarily project management now, um, where I work with specific customers on their different types of orders. That's the low down on what I do. Great. Thank you so much. I'm going to pause here and ask if there are any questions from the audience at this point. I wonder if you, maybe um, you all could talk about, so you talked about um, what your work week looks like. What is, what do you say is the um, hour, hour breakdown? Or if you have maybe like a range in terms of ebb and flow, a really busy week might be so many, a not so busy would be so many. So, um, so I, I think that's maybe hinting to the work-life balance thing. Um, for me, I could work as much I um, I could I could be working a lot more hours but I each week but I try to keep it to right around 40 um, and that's in an intentional choice on my part um, I think it can vary a lot because um, I'm dealing with customers projects and so Depending on submission volume, you know, I have weeks that will be as low as 28 hours. Um, currently, we have heavy submission volume and sort of lower capacity, so my work weeks are more like 45, 50 hours. Um, there's always ways to spend my time if I get through these sort of, you know, my main projects well under 40 hours. There are other things I can take on in the company. Um, so there's some variation there, week to week. Um, it's not seasonal. You know, when it's time for dissertations, we get lots of long submissions. And 
things like that. Um, start from the standpoint that I always have more work than I have time. So the game is, is strategic workload minimization or management. <laughs> um, and how do I want to how do I want to deal with that fact? I essentially will always my baseline is I'll always work a nine hour day, more or less in the office um, baseline. So um, I I don't ever have a work week that's less than forty five hours. Um, ordinarily several days a week. Um, I'm also working a few hours in the evening. Um, so I'm probably north of fifty on average. Um, I make a choice never to work on the weekends, ever. Um, only Sunday night after my sons go to bed. Never other times. That's hard. That comes with a cost on the work side. But I kind of make a choice to always be 100% present um, as a father um, on the weekends. Um, and then it's just a question of how, you know, like it's not work-life balance, it's work-life synthesis. How do, there is no balance, so it's a question, and there isn't. Start from that standpoint. How am I going to synthesize these two things that are naturally out of balance with each other? So some of it is, you know, um, I just sort of set as an expectation that I'm always gone from the office in time to be home for dinner. I set as an expectation that when there's a little, like, you know, end of unit reading presentation at the elementary school that a parent should be at, that I'm there. So, you know, maybe if it's mid-morning, I do some work from the house for a couple hours, and I go to the thing, and then I drive to work, and I'm there at lunchtime. And I just kind of move it around so that, you know, so that the, 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 the cost is a lot of work and the benefit is um, getting to be able to do the things in the rest of my life on my terms. Um, you know, the other thing is that I could work lots more. I, so I'm a very ambitious person professionally. I, you know, I like where I am now. I actually want to, you know, do even more. Um, so right now, I, I'm choosing not to say no to a lot of opportunities at work because they create opportunities for me. Um, but at the same time, if I wanted to say my day just doesn't allow me to do these things on my list, I would say that to the person who, who manages me. I, I could. Um, and I, you know, I could get away with it, but my career would not progress. You know, I should say I, I like to think of my career and of careers as assets that we manage and we want them to appreciate and retain their value. Um, they retain, you know, like any like any sort of commodity, they retain their value by appreciating. Um, when they're not appreciating, their value goes down perversely. Um, and so, you know, I choose, I make those choices. You don't have to. Yeah, I, mean, I would agree with that in a lot of ways because you can always, you always have enough work to keep working and keep working and keep working. And, you know, we're all PhD students or, you know, postdocs. So we all have that tendency to work, 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 work. So you can always find enough work to do. But it is a, a matter of sort of setting your boundaries and what you're willing to do. And in some ways, that can almost be harder, especially when Robert, with Robert and I's positions, because it's, it's so flexible that you can find yourself working all the time at all hours of the night, um, early, early in the morning. So you really do have to set those boundaries in terms of, I'm going to start working here, I'm going to stop working. Here and then pick and choose the opportunities that you're going to follow. Um, in our company, we ha do have a lot of opportunities to get involved in different projects. Um, some of that involves data analysis, some of it involves customer service, community project development. Um, so there's a lot of things to say yes to, but you really have to sort of hone in on what it is that you want to do. And I think it's pretty easy to do once you've been working somewhere for a little bit of time. You kind of get a sense of where you see yourself going and sort of hone in on those those opportunities and do what you can. Um, I know definitely balancing time has been you know, a struggle for me. I had a son less than a month, or not less than a month ago, less than a year ago. And up until he was 10 months, he was at home with me while I was working 40 hours a week. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of one of those, those balanced things where it finally got to the point where I can't balance both of these things anymore. So um, now he's in childcare a couple of days a week, and that has helped me to sort of not be working from 7 a.m. until 1 a.m., sort of off and on. Um, but yeah, it's just a matter of deciding what you want to do and setting your own boundaries <coughs> or anything else. For those of you um, who didn't create your own job, um, can you tell us a little bit about the interview process? 
Um, and I know everybody might have had a little slightly different interview process, but I think folks in the room may be familiar with a faculty um, campus visit interview process. And what is it like in the private sector? And maybe I'll start with Krista. Um, my interview is interesting. Um, my company is very focused on culture. Um, we have a very particular culture, and there's a lot of sort of it's sort of a geek culture, so to speak, um, being into Star Wars and having, having all those sorts of interests are, are very important. So my interview was actually very um, informal for the most part. Um, I did have to do an editing test. I had been an editor for quite some time, but most of the, most of the papers that we look at are biomedical in nature or science. Focus. We do do humanities editing, we do do editing in the social sciences, but by and large a lot of our submissions are, are in the hard sciences. Um, so I did have to do an editing test um, so that they could see I actually do the job that I would be being hired for. Um, but then most of the rest of the interview really focused on them asking me about graduate school, what were my experiences in graduate school, why was I applying for a position that was you know outside of academia. Um, and then, um, I'm trying to remember some of the really funny questions they asked me. Um, they asked me some questions about ghosts and aliens and zombies and things like that. <laughs> um, and then they had me stay for a team lunch, because every couple of weeks we always have a team lunch where people who are, in, who are working locally will get together and we'll have meetings and you know just kind of hang out and see people face to face, since the majority of our work is done at home. Um, so that was kind of my informal interview process. Thank you. So I've only interviewed twice um, after LGL. Um, once, <laughs> so by the way, I, I, I moved to Washington in 2000 when I thought I was done with my dissertation, but wasn't. Um, <laughs> so I thought, oh, it's just you know a couple months of evenings and weekends. So I actually, you know, I walked in um, 2003, but um, left New Haven in 2000. So in 2000, I um, moved to D.C. I had uh, that interview, and then the one when I came to North Carolina three years later, or so. Um, and they were very similar, very, very, I think, s relatively standard for a corporate environment. I had three interviews with different people, both on and off the team, so that there could be the range of feedback out to lunch so that I can see, you know, so that they can see, you know, if I chew with my mouth open or if I, you know, am rude to the waiter, whatever, those things that are subtle and important, um, and you need, you know, the, and, and um, the ability to conduct small talk, the ability to have a non-professional conversation over lunch is something that, I, you know, I've been a hiring manager for a decade myself now, I look for that, um, it's, a, it's a related soft skill, it's totally related skill, so they were pretty standard. Um, uh, in a larger sense, in these interviews, play to your strengths. This is what I say. I, I didn't realize in the first one that I was playing with my strengths, but I definitely did in time for the second one, a few years later. Um, uh, so I was an English, <coughs> English major, English PhD, all of those things. Um, I, in, in being interviewed for a job as an editor, I, I, I had spent some time actually as a, a baker during the summer. My, so talk about the signs that you know you want to leave academia. Um, the summer <laughs> of, between my first and second years of graduate school, I, um, instead of taking the fellowship to go do some work in a library or, you know, all the things I could have done trying to grant, um, I, I worked as a baker from, you know, 8 p.m. until 4 a.m. with, um, it, was, it was great, it was, a, it was me, it was a painter who had just graduated from the Yale School of Art, who needed to pay his bills, painting wasn't doing it, and then a bunch of guys from Mexico and Colombia. And I loved it, and um, for $8 an hour in 1996, I totally would have actually made it my career. And I thought about that going back to graduate school. It was the first thing that told me. Um, but in any case, um, you know, it's, it's this cool thing. I, I'll never take it off my resume because it's a great conversation starter. And it started a conversation in my first interview, and they said, a baker, you know, what, how is that anything like what else you've done? And I spun this story from a kind of poetic part of myself where, um, you know, the close work of rolling pastries or rolling dough um, is completely like the close work of editing. And, you know, it's focus and it's determination and it's, you know, blocking out everything else. Um, and I wove a web, I didn't realize I was doing this, I'm just a guy among whose skills is communication, right? So I wove a web and I, I later found out from the person who interviewed me was my boss and is now a friend still. 
you know, that that was what kind of like sealed the deal. Play to your strengths. Um, you're going to find places that value academics, and you're going to find places that don't. Don't bother with the ones that don't. Um, the thing I think about is um, when uh, my mother, you know, told her nerdy high school son, honey, if they don't, about girls, honey, if they don't want you, you don't want them. The same thing is true uh, for your employers. Um, the ones that don't want you because you're an academic, because they think you're too smart, because they think that you won't understand their business, that because they think that you um, will want to be promoted over them in a year. Honestly, there's very little good in that. Look for it. The signs are not hard to see. Um, go, you know, focus, play to your strengths. The, the people, the employers that want you, it's easy to tell the, the companies that like academics, partly because some are there, partly because of um, you know, how they respond to your outreach. Um, you will, you know, when you're there, you know, it's your, your brand is to be the academic. Like it or not, that's your brand at, on, on, the, on the job market. Um, play, you know. I, I'm less quirky than the person I play at work because playing that quirky person who has that academic degree from the fancy school is something that benefits me. You know, I, I literally make like, you know, uh, arcane references that I know people will get just every now and then just to keep the brand going. It's silly, but it works. Play to your strengths. And that's who you are. You'll always be that person. You might as well take advantage of it. So I said that I found the job at the, the career fair, but that was to start as a contract editor. And then after working that for about a year, I saw internally on the website that there was an opening for a managing editor, quality control editor. And I applied for that, and initially I took a phone interview. Um, and that was fairly structured, and I think sort of stereotypical of an interview, where I was asked things like, you know, tell us about a time in which you failed and what you learned from that so, interview question. Um, then after that, first interview, I had an interview in the office that I think was five hours long, and it was with a series of different people uh, moving around, seeing the office, uh, meeting different people in a sort of five different hour long meetings. And then it was much less of the sort of stereotypical interview process, I think, and it was in a big contrast, not just to the stereotypical interview process, but to the academic sort of meeting I would have. It was much less about um, well, with the academics than, you know, here's what's your idea, defend your idea, let me object to it. And it was more about me and the fit I would have with the company. And so I was asked more personal questions. I was asked things like, you know, tell us an uh, activity that allows you to find flow. Which, you know, took me sort of off guard, but I felt, I felt okay in that environment. And it was nice to sort of have it. The interview was much focused on whether I was a fit with the company, which was really good because it seemed more personal. <coughs> because whether their interests were for them, whether I fit with the company for their sake or for my sake, worked out for me because I went in sort of feeling that I could get a handle on whether it was a fit for me. And the environment in the company is very uh, academic-based. Sort of interactions are that way. So that was good. We talked about cupcakes. <laughs> so go do some research. <laughs> can, can I add one thing as a, from a hiring manager's perspective? If you're interviewing with me, I already know you can do the job to this point about fit because I have um, uh, based it on your resume and on an initial phone screen and then I've given you some kind of assessment, literally a test that you've sent in. So if you're sitting across the table from me in my office, I know you'll be able to do the job, and it's all about fit. And I think that more and more these days, I, I don't know my, you know, I don't see enough to say this with any generalizations. Melissa, please let me know. But I, I feel like that's pretty common, and you should be, you should expect that, you know, be be that person, be the, um, be their colleague already in the interview, because it, at that point, definitely for me, and I think for, in so many situations, it's about fit. At that point. I'd just add, um, because of course I didn't have an interview. Per, per se. Um, but in uh, another way, I, I interview almost every day when I speak to potential clients. 
Um, but as, uh, and, and that's kind of separate, but I want to talk about what, what you said is um, absolutely it's about fit by the time, for the, in most cases, in some fields, it's going to still be like technical skills, um, depending, maybe engineering, but no one in here is an engineer. Um, but as an outgrowth, an expansion of my business, just as a, a need, was I went and I've done training and I have interviewing preparation certification. And I also offer that and that was just because I kept having people come back to me and say, okay, I got an interview, now what? And I'm like, oh, what did Andy tell me? Use the star method, you know, so, so I really um, schooled myself on that and I took, um, you know, I, I did a self-study course and certification and there's lots of um, strategic ways to prepare for interviews, but yes, it's always keeping in mind, it's conveying your message about who you are, your brand, what you offer, but it's under this whole context of you need to be building rapport. And because at, by the time they bring it in, say three people, all three of you are going to be qualified at least enough where the, the person can see potential that you could possibly fit. So, it, and it's also, it needs to be seen as a conversation, um, a mutual conversation, right, about assessing and that can help relieve some of the anxiety of interviewing um, and also because you don't want to work for a place that, you know, hates the fact that you're a parent and want to have dinner with your children, right? Um, but yeah, you know, going in and trying to, to build rapport and, and show fit is, I would agree with that 100%. Does anybody in the audience have a follow-up question about it, the interviewing process in particular? I have a question that's not related to the interviewing process. Is, can I go ahead and ask it? It's, it's, I, I really appreciated um, hearing Heidi's experience in transitioning out of academia, what that was like for you, and why you chose to do what you, you're doing now, and how you created your business. And I was wondering, just for the other panelists, what motivated you to go into business and consulting? Um, maybe for those of us, who don't have any business and consulting experience and are entrenched in academia right now, just hear about <coughs> how you transitioned out and what maybe you do that into the, this field would be interesting to hear. So, um, you know, I think it kind of does begin almost when you are entrenched in sort of academia because you're always kind of thinking ahead. You're always thinking, what am I going to do? You know, what if I don't, don't get a tenure professorship? And so you begin to kind of think of what are my transferable skills. What are the sort of things that I like to do? Um, and for me, part of it was also sort of, you know, I can do art history and I can, you know, continue to write about illuminated medieval manuscripts or I can sort of help somebody. Um, and and that was always a sort of thing for me, is that I always felt like in academia I wasn't really helping anybody. There was something so, so self-serving about it, in a way. Um, and so, while I was at UNC, I worked with um, a lot of Chinese exchange students who would come in um, and working with them on English, and most of it was spoken, but a lot of it was also written. Um, and so that was kind of a transferable skill, um, is being able to sort of get what they're trying to express and then translate it into sort of natural stuff in English. Um, and so that, in that way, it was sort of a, Editing was a good fit. Um, this particular company was a good fit. Um, but I had always been one of those people, too, who my friends and colleagues would ask me to read over their papers and edit them for them. So it was kind of it was kind of a natural flow. So I think it's just looking at the things that that you're you're good at and you're interested in if you're thinking about transitioning out of academia. Um, but I think part of it, for me at least, was sort of out of necessity. I'm one of those people who kind of likes to plan my future five years in advance. And it was coming to that point where I couldn't really do that. So I wanted to make sure that, that I was somewhere viable. It's such a good question. It's so important. Our conversion stories. How did we get from there to here? I went to a liberal arts college. 1,800 students, and I feel like maybe a third of my professors lived within walking distance. And that was the career I wanted for myself. That was the graduate school for me was pre-professional training for that career that I got to graduate school and realized didn't exist. 
and I spent, so that I, I graduated college in 1994. I spent my year in Washington as a reporter, loved it. Went to Yale in the fall of 95. So I spent between 1995 and 2000, really from the first month, grappling with this realization that I was in the, in the wrong career path for myself. Um, I wanted to be a teacher more than anything. Um, and you know, all kinds of things along the way. One was my utter, you know, at a molecular level, my antipathy to doing academic research. Um, but also, so I had the great fortune to uh, win a teaching prize, a graduate school-wide teaching prize. Yay! Guess what my colleagues told me? That's a black mark on my CV because it shows that I'm that dedicated to research. So over the course of those few years, I realized more and more that, that I needed to do something um, else. And certainly that you know, experience in the bakery told me, as did so many other things. Um, I got really good at cooking because I just went home every day at four and spent three hours making dinner. Um, and so, uh, you know, during the semester. Um, I, it's hard to let go of it, though, because you're at a great school, be it Yale or Duke or so many others, your career is bright, um, but, you know, finally, I, I kind of had a set of, in the summer of 2000, I had a set of things that I realized all at the same time. One is that the career I was preparing myself for actually wasn't in academia. It was out of academia because I realized what my skills were. Um, and that those were completely transferable to another kind of work. The exact same time I spent the summer teaching um, essay personal writing to middle schoolers, which was awesome. I knew simultaneously that I never wanted to do that as a career, um, but that it was awesome because 13-year-olds are crazy in a really fun way. Um, uh, and um, I, it, that gave me the realization that there's something else. Right. I think the reason I hadn't yet left is because I didn't know what the something else is. I knew it wasn't going to be baking because I couldn't do anything on $8 an hour um, for my career um, as much as I wanted to. Um, and then at the exact same time, I met the person who is now my wife and sort of had all of these reasons to, to, to change, to shift, to do the push. And so we moved to Washington together in 2000. Um, and I realized that the career I'd been preparing myself for in academia was one that used all of the skills I had in a much more interesting, satisfying, and diverse way than academia ever would. All those skills, um, critical thinking, um, and research and writing and persuasive communication, and turn teaching into staff management, and all of those things. Um, actually, uh, if you look at me on paper, if you're not someone with academic background, you don't think I'm using my experience at Yale, but actually I'm using it much more than I would if I was a guy who talked about Emerson every day for a few hours and then went home and wrote about Emerson for a few hours. Much more. It just took a push. I think something similar, particularly with the teaching. And so it took me nine years to finish my PhD. So then I moved out here and you know got to a point where I think maybe subconsciously I was starting to explore other things because um, there is a sort of ideal career path where you, know, you get this tenure track job and you're teaching some, but you spend lots of time doing research and writing. And that was the job I wanted, not because of the teaching. I enjoyed teaching a lot, but what I really wanted to do was get to a point where I had a lower load on me and I could focus on getting research out there, whether it be mine or, or others. Um, and so towards the end of my academic career, I started doing work with, uh, with the writing center and the biology department. It was a grant where they were developing an algorithm to judge uh, STEM dissertations. And I did some work on that, and that was enjoyable. And you know, when it came to time to go on the job market, something similar to, to Joshua, I was told, you know, I need to bury some of this teaching experience. You know, Ten years of teaching experience at three different schools. Actually, you don't put that all on your CV. Who knew that that was not going to be good unless you wanted to end up with a job that was, you know, uh, heavy load, 12 courses a year sort of thing. Um, and so then I did go on the job market uh, 
for an academic position, but you know the things did not look all that rosy, and it looked like it was going to be lots of teaching jobs, and not many of those jobs where it was going to be a low teaching load with time to write and research and spend time with grad students and helping them get their research out there. And so at that point, I sort of had to weigh matters, and you know the uncertainty of the academic job market was very unpleasant. I had you know, hundred applications out with you know. Potentially, in six months from then, I could have moved anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. I had no idea. Um, but and no say. <laughs> well, ideally, you would have some say, but yeah, no. There's no realistic uh, idea that I would have any say in the matter. Um, and so then I started looking more seriously about what I could do here, connected to research and writing. And been here for ten years. My daughter grew up here, and you know, we own a house here, and. Uh, it was just the balance came out that way, that the uncertainty and the continual uncertainty of the job market that year, going on the job market the next year, versus <coughs> you know, committing to a career where I could be connected more directly to writing and research and publication and uh, stay in Durham. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, you want to address this question too? I think I kind of. Um, did. Yeah, I will. I mean, I will. I guess I can just add that um, I think I'm, I'm, in some ways I'm hearing a theme too that is kind of a very um, quiet theme that maybe some of our priorities shifted in ways that maybe we didn't expect. Right? I did, I I came down here married already, um, but once I had my first daughter, um, I did the whole thing of wearing two hats where. Um, for some people, I was the full-time graduate student who um, also happened to have a kid who, yeah, I didn't put in daycare because it was my decision not to, and um, so I did the whole, every, every nap I was working, um, and uh, every, you know, at night up working, and, um, and yeah, your, your priorities shift, and that's okay. Um, right, you have the moment when you realize, and, and it's not to make a judge, a cast a judgment on people who um, want to continue that tenure track route. I have dear friends who are doing it, and women who have two kids. You know, my one friend, she's doing it really well. But my priorities shifted, and when you know, when I had two, so, so the, like I was saying, the one hat of yeah, this full time graduate student who also has a kid, and then the other hat is the stay at home mom who also happens to be in grad school and work a part-time job, right? And that balance is just, it wears on you. And it was something that I did, um, it was with intention, and I don't regret it. Um, but it, there comes a point where, at least for me, yeah, there are certain things that you, you, is, um, you get a little, I don't know, like, yeah, you just, things clarify and shift and change a little bit, and I think that that's okay. It's perfectly fine to accept that, and it's fine to say, you know what, I want to stay in this region or this state or in this country, <laughs> right? <laughs> or, you know, and I think that those, some of the big life changes, you know, life major life changes typically correspond with when we're doing these degrees, right, in your 20s and 30s. So, so that, you know, so I, I went with it, I accepted it, and I created a career path around what I wanted. So, cool. Thank you. Um, um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little about, like, maybe the practicalities, the nitty gritty of finishing a dissertation while at the same time searching for a job outside academia, and how that worked for you. Difficult. <laughs> I can say that. I was working at the same time as I was I was doing the writing process on my dissertation. Um, so that was difficult. I actually did for a while drop down to part time. So I was working twenty hours a week and then, then writing and I was also pregnant at the time. So I had a very definite deadline for myself. Um, yeah. when the baby's here I need to be done. Um, so that was helpful. But um, yeah, I think, it, like I said, you can, there's always work to be done, and you can always, you know, give yourself more work to do, and I think when you are finishing up your dissertation, you're having to write, write for grants, and then look for jobs, and then apply for jobs. 
um, that just kind of goes on top of everything else. And I, I can't say that there was any great way that I found the extra time for it. I just had to, just had to do it. I had to buckle down for that that period of time and just just do it. Just every day, sort of look for what was out there, and then identify which opportunities were there and identify for them. It's awful. <laughs> on the one hand. But it's less awful than you think, on the other hand. Because, and I'm about to say something that you're going to rebel against, because it's in none of our natures. But, when you know you're finishing a dissertation for, God, I hate saying this out loud. When you know you're finishing a dissertation for completion, rather than success on the academic job market, quite simply, it takes less time. <laughs> That's part of where you find the time to do it. Um, you know, it's awful. And, you know, uh, <clears throat> Richard Broadhead was one of my advisors at Yale. And, you know, I'm afraid I'll see him and hear him saying that. Um, it, that's part of how you do it. You, you can pull back on it's not. We don't do that. That's not who we are. We don't get here um, by doing that. But do it. Um, you, that, pulling back on the throttle a little bit in terms of um, your academic work, knowing that your goal is um, to uh, walk across that stage whenever it is so that you can um, pass that checkpoint on the way to another path, you know, on, on, onto another path is, is incredibly um, freeing. Um, because in addition to freeing up literally time, you're freeing up psychic weight. We all know that psychic weight is awful. Um, and if you know that you have to write a certain, to, you know, to a certain level of the, the quality, um, and I mean, the quantity, even that's on the hop. Like if you know that you, you, you determine your goal, you realize exactly where it is relative to your old goal. Um, do that, you'll find some time there. That helps. I didn't really uh, have that balance. I was teaching and working on my dissertation. The work I did with the uh, the algorithm for the STEM manuscripts that was during the summer when I was not teaching. But the the career fair I went to was actually on the day of my defense. So I really did not put any time into looking at a non-academic career path. And so I don't know if that was sort of fear of the defense itself. <laughs> Maybe I should go to the net. career. <laughs> yeah. So I was without a net until that morning. And so I, but I could have, I think, and it probably would have been wise to spend some time putting an effort for a non-academic career path. And I could have done that by teaching less. I think. Um, I'd just say I would urge everybody here to keep doing what you're doing by attending events like this. Because um, when I was finishing, when I was finishing for those two and a half, three years, right? Like, that's, that's a long time. <laughs> but um, I never felt like I could fit in these types of call them professional development opportunities, right? And this is where, you know, after this, connect with people, connect with us on LinkedIn. Start, even if, it, if your goal is like, um, one event I'm going to attend a month, right? Or, in, or you know, I'm going to dedicate one hour a week to seeing what networking groups there are out there. Or, you know, or set, set a realistic goal, but make yourself accountable to it. You know, pencil it in because that's, you know, I had a friend who, she took advantage of so many things that the Career Center was offering. And, I think it was before this series had started, and um, and I always at that time I remember thinking, oh my gosh, if I only had enough time to attend all these things, um, which and that's just speaking to even though what I I think I did an okay job, um, I could I you know I could have utilized the resources that are here um, so much more effectively than I did so. You know, to pencil it in, make it something where, okay, once a month, I'm going to attend something here that is going to force me to look beyond this footnote that I'm working on, right? Um, and, and that way, it's by the time you are defending, you will have ideas, if not something lined up already. You know, you don't, I work with people, I, I have the people who contact me 
after they have the PhD, and most institutions aren't like Duke, where you, we have four years of continued support through the Career Center. Um, most universities now, you have maybe six months, some the day you defend, you're cut off from their career services. So I, help, I end up helping the people who say, you know, I was just so focused on the dissertation, I assumed I'd get the tenure track job. And now I realize not only did I not get it, but I never even wanted it, but I don't know what I want. <laughs> and, I, and I help people navigate that. But if you're able to be proactive now, when all this stuff is free for you, um, it's going to do wonders for you in your future. Can I throw out another piece of the concept of what your job search is, by the way, um, which is uh, making time for your job search means also making time for the internship you're going to get. Um, it's really Likely. important. I, you know, so I've been, as I said, a hiring manager for almost a decade. I've hired two life sciences PhDs for non-academic jobs, but I have never hired a humanities PhD. And that's my thing. I would love to do that. But I've never had the right person come at the right time. So I've had a lot of people apply for the jobs, people with humanities and social sciences PhDs, but they're people who are making the switch immediately and don't have the relevant experience. And I mean, I would, if you spent a summer doing relevant work, that would change things that would put you on 80 or 90 percent of the way there for my goals as a hiring manager. Um, it's, it's astonishing how much work you don't think has the same weight as a quote unquote real job, a full time job. That has a ton of weight. It has a ton of weight. Think about where you want to be X number of years from now and use your network to, to get some, some relevant work in that field. Even if it's, the other thing is that if it's a few hours a week, like literally if it's an afternoon a week on your resume, that, and you, let's say you do that for you know, two semesters, you're working one afternoon a week, but on your resume that says September to May. It does, it's true. Uh, you know, make that a part of it. I was fortunate that I had spent a year doing work outside of academia that was directly related to my first job after academia. Um, I wouldn't have gotten that first job if it weren't for that. Um, make sure that's in your experience too because the immediate pivot, it doesn't look good. I'm a guy who wants to hire humanities and social science PhDs and I've never done it because I've never found the person who's done that. Do it. Um. Um, so I have a question about as you start doing all these things for an academic career before you finish, um, would you guys recommend? Did you did you have a process of keeping it all secret from your department, <laughs> or is it at one point when you finally break the news to your advisor, who may be really disappointed from that point on, that you just might be considering an academic alternative, or just like how to navigate that tricky? In between period before you finally, before you before you're actually committed to a non-academic job. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that um, I'm sure we can all speak to that. Um, I think that my impression now is that things are changing a little bit, so that there's um, more open acknowledgement that the job market doesn't support all of the PhDs. Um, who want the tenure track jobs. And I did keep what I was doing to myself in the sense that I didn't go around advertising, like this is my plan A. But I also, um, I didn't really see it as relevant to my work with my advisor and my committee for completing the dissertation, right? Like my committee was, I mean, I was blessed to have a committee, it was, you know, very strong committee and, you know, very um, prolific in their fields, right? But that means they've been successful in academia and have dedicated their careers to academia, not to becoming a business owner. So I did um, make the choice of, I worked on this quietly, um, but I mean, everybody knew I worked at the writing studio. My, well, not everybody, like why would, who cares? I mean, they have a lot of other students to, to, to be helping. But um, I, did, I did wait to tell um, my advisor because I wasn't sure how she would react. Um, and after I told her, um, she was thrilled for me. She was absolutely thrilled in doing you know, what 
my advisor does, she immediately shot off an email to somebody about, you know, oh, here's this connection, you know, th this is great, this person needs to know your story, and she was fully supportive, and still, when um, I had a, um, thanks to Melissa, a, a media opportunity, you know, what did I do? I'm like, okay, I'm being interviewed by US News and World Report, what do I do? Laura. Hope you're well. Do you have any advice for interviewing? <laughs> and and she, you know, my advisor is, you know, I'm not in contact with her as much now, of course, but um, I kept it quiet, you know, because of that fear that I think a lot of people have. But mine, at least, you know, turned out to be, you know, I, I ended up having very supportive people. But I did keep it quiet until after I defended. I think it depends on the relationship you have with your advisor and your committee, um, how much you want to disclose. I mean, I was, you know, pretty open about where I was working and what I was doing at the time, but there was no sort of need to know that I had, like, made a decision about anything. Um, because it was always still in the back of my mind, like, you still have to defend your dissertation, you know, there's still that, that extra need to go through. So I think it was really sort of on a, on a need to know basis. It wasn't something that really came up. So I think in a lot of ways it's something that, I did quietly, but I wasn't you know, intentionally secretive about it. Um, let's see. Um, but I also think, even though it's not something that's very widely talked about, I do think that our professors tend to know what the job market is right now. Um, and I know particularly in my field, I mean, there's been kind of two good research jobs, you know, that have been coming out for a year. At least since 2008, things have been pretty bad. So I think they they know the reality of the job market. So it can't come as like this great surprise if you're hearing in your dissertation that you might be thinking about other opportunities as well. Even though I did not pursue a non-academic career until the day of my defense, I defended in April, and so I had a big window there before the job market started in December. So I was, you know, starting down the non-academic career path. And I did not talk to my advisor because I don't know, I wanted him focused on writing a letter for my academic uh, pursuits. Um, but looking back, I wish I had have. I don't know if it would have benefited me so much, but in the philosophy department, they were not that in touch with how bad the job market was. I don't think. I mean, the job market had been bad since 2008, but there have been lots of changes in the way the hiring went. And they were not prepared um, for the job market to be as bad as it was the last couple of years. It took them by surprise. And from talking to other grad students, there was a general sort of lack of awareness of this from the professors and a lack of discussion about uh, non-academic career paths. And I sort of wish that I had have talked to my advisor more because I think that this is sort of a awareness that needs to be in the department and there need to be these sort of discussions <coughs> and increased openness uh, to other grad students talking to their advisors about things other than letters you know, recommendation. Uh, I, I didn't tell my advisor until the um, last minute when it was time to start preparing for my academic job search and I said, all right, we need to talk, I'm not going to do that. Um, I, you know, I, I did try to hide it. I had one professor who just unfortunately wasn't in my field who I talked to for years about it. She was great. Um, um, when I told my advisor, he didn't understand. What? Why? What? Why are you leaving this? You know, this great world. And then, kind of, once he realized that, you know, I just realized, and I, maybe he made a calculation that he could spend time with other people because he didn't need as much. You know, for me, I don't know. He he was okay with it, and he kept it reasonably quiet too. Um, and, and it was it, it was alright, but I. I kept I hope it's better. So I'm going to ask one more question that might be on people's minds, and I'm going to let panelists opt in to answering this question if you feel comfortable. Um, and that is, what would be uh, salary expectations for someone who is entry level in your field or industry? Um, for folks who are transitioning out of graduate school or postdoc, um, what could they expect in the private sector? So, all, so obviously there's not some base salary range of an entrepreneur other than usually negative. I mean, <laughs> most, <laughs> most businesses, it's going to take several years for you to actually turn a profit. Um, but I was really strategic with what 
you know, what I decided to do. Um, and I have very low overhead, so that should be, con you know, taken into account. Um, but, um, and even though tax laws are that when you're self-employed, you get taxed at quite a high rate, there's also a whole lot of deductions. So my greatest expenses are um, my computer, you know, when I, I, but I get to deduct mileage. I get to deduct, because I have a home office, um, because it doesn't make sense for me to have a brick and mortar store when you have clients all over the place and working different times, you know, in different times. Um, so you get a home office deduction, you get a certain percentage of your utilities, you know, deducted. So you, so that helps out. Um, the first year, I, and it was only an eight month calendar year for me because I got my LLC, you know, in the spring. Um, that year I turned a small profit um, after the, you know, after taxes, my year, this, so 2014 then, my goal was to double the revenue, right, which is different than net profit, but double my revenue, and I surpassed that goal by 28%, and there's not that much, you know, going on, you know, just a you know, month and a half so far, but every month, um, I'm steadily increasing, so... Um, it's so I think that if going back to the question of how many hours you work if I was more of like the typical entrepreneur who's like 80 hours a week sign me up um, it would be even more but I'm very careful about maintaining the balance between work and family um, yeah, I, could numbers. I don't really have a field I mean, it's my liberal arts career. It's, I, I don't have a field, so I can't really speak to the field. But one thought is that um, I was floored by um, my first um, salary. Floored in 2000. Um, I made a number that was, I mean, you know, I, I worked all semester long in a writing lab at a university, a kind of commuter school near Yale. Um, uh, all semester long, I pulled in $900 and bought my wife's engagement ring. Like, that was, you know, that was that for me, and then I made this number. And I was flirted. I was DC, I was walking around going, I know there are lawyers and lobbyists here, but this is very naive, but there's no way they make more than me. Um, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to think back about it, because the number wasn't big, it was in the, you know, the mid five figures. Um, and uh, I was flirted by it, but the, the, the thought is, if they had said a number $20,000 less than that, I would have said, that's awesome, <laughs> yes! <laughs> I mean, they could have cut my salary in half, and I would have said, that's great, it's so much more than I've made, <laughs> ever. <laughs> don't let that happen to you. Don't yeah. be, don't, don't use the expectations of what you're used to now, what you're used to living off of, and, you know, I, I felt rich the summer I made $8 an hour. I literally did. So, um, uh, you know, there's a, there's a value out there that's actually at this totally different, you know, it's a complete, <laughs> scale is it's totally different. different. It's, it's yeah. totally different and that is something that um, as a business owner that has really been an, um, an adjustment for me. It's a great one to get used to knowing that um, yeah what, you, what you're able to charge and, um, and people are grateful to be working with you. It, um, <laughs> it is a total <laughs> mind shift from what you're used to be. Um, same thing you know at the writing studio thinking yeah. when I break it down by hour this is this is this is decent money, and then being able to say, well, what was you know like I mean I I love that job but um, but yeah it's a different scale and do your research on that and you know preparing for Less interviews <laughs> yeah don't say a direct number but a range or whatever but yeah do your research and don't be afraid of that number. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to the, if they don't want you, you don't want them, presumably you're at this point, you're talking to someone who wants you. So you're talking to someone who sees your academic experience as an asset. So for you to expect 40, 50, 60 right off the bat isn't unreasonable, even though that's, you know, seems, maybe seems like a lot of money. You know, like, that's not unreasonable because... You know, you, you're going in there, you're confident that you have an asset that they want, and when you show that confidence, they respond in kind, mm -hmm. um, in all kinds of ways, by offering you a job and by offering you a salary that's um, mindful of that asset. Um, 
Um, so if you're not this guy who goes, well, you know, I've been making 18 for a few years, you know, you'll, it changes everything. Well, at this point, since we have about two minutes of remaining, I want to thank all our panelists so much for sharing their perspective and expertise with us today um, and give an opportunity for you to connect with them real briefly because I know they brought business cards. Um, please join me in thanking our panelists.